Wonderful. Okay. So, oh, this works. That's amazing. So, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, it was really lovely to be here. And let's see if this works. Okay. So, as I, as she said, you just can Google me. Basically, uh, I'm no one fam famous, so I won't talk a lot about my life. You have every information you need there to know who I am. So, um, so this is one of the first talks of the morning. You might be, as I am, a little bit jet-lagged. So that's fully OK. I don't expect from you to do a lot of work now. And I will make your life even a bit easier. So, so that you don't have to take your smartphone out every two seconds to take a picture of the slides, you will here have a link at the end of the presentation with all the slides and even some visual summaries so that you can really enjoy now, go in the seat, and be very happy about this little moment we will have together. Does that work for you? Wonderful. So, um, there is a lot of talk about the future of service design. And you might have seen these acronyms. Uh, I love especially the last one. Um, you know, what is the future of service design with AI? What is the future of service design with machine learning? Or with this BS stuff? Um, and here, and the question for me was always when I saw this stuff was, yeah, that's all awesome, and I really love that. But I have a problem myself with my little imposter syndrome, which tells me, hey, Daniele, you don't know shit about the past, so why are you concentrating so much energy for the future? And that's what basically happens. Is I really realized I don't know anything about the past of service design. When people ask me, oh, how old is service design, I said, Oh, you know, uh, might be some years, uh, might have started some in Nordic, current, Nordic countries. You know, they, they did everything, so that's normal. But I didn't really know. So I went on a journey, basically, where the idea was to learn from the past and see if there is something that I can learn from there to kind of kill my imposter syndrome of being a service designer. And from, in this journey, I've learned a, a few things. And one of these things is really simple, is that service design has stolen a lot of things from other disciplines. And basically, we could say that service design is the iPhone of disciplines. We didn't invent anything. We just brought the good stuff together and made it work in a nice way. Uh, basically, what the iPhone did. And so that's kind of one of the learnings I had. And another learning could be that one, that we can really build bridges between the present and the past of what happened in history. And we can really build bridges between what is happening in other disciplines and what is happening in our discipline. So that's basically what I will talk now in the next 25 minutes, 27 minutes exactly. Uh, it's a bit, I will give you a bit of a tiny history uh, of service design. And just to do a bit of some expectation management from the start, um, I'm Daniele. I'm just a service designer, maybe not even a good one. Uh, and I'm no historian. I'm not an, an academic guy. Uh, you can see I'm not serious. I don't have a shirt. I don't have anything which makes me look serious outside the glasses. And so basically, I don't know shit. But what I did is I wanted to know more about this kind of service design thing. And what do you, what do, you do when you want to learn more? You go on Google and you write service design history book and nothing. And that was kind of my big problem. And so basically, what I did to fix it was to Google and find other people, which were much smarter than me, who wrote about that kind of stuff. Uh, just a few lines there and there. And what happened after that, uh, just spent a long weekend doing that, and basically you get 100 moments, historical moments, that you can say, say oh, these are in interesting to me. But are there the real history of service design? I have no clue. But basically, these are the ones that I found interesting. And what happens is I basically published that online, uh, made it really open, and lazy people like me, who are not academics, who don't know shit either, but Googled service design history book, arrived on the page and said, oh, wow, Daniele, thank you so much. Uh, I'm lazy, and now I learned something. And what's really uh, great is that the academic people, the historians, they came and they said, Daniele, that's very wrong what you did here. Uh, that's not true. That's not the date. Oh, that's not the guy. You spelled that in another way. And you know what's awesome? Is that this is all public. So it made the book even better. Because then people know 
I did shit, but this is much better, and this is the real information. And that's really improved the book. And so today, I will just give you kind of a 10 dates preview of this uh, 100 moments that I selected. And basically, there is kind of six dates that I love, which are dates that will make you look smarter during, the, during dinner parties. You know, the kind of stuff you can say, did you know that in 6062, which is not a date even, this happened? And everyone is like, oh, wow. What do you do as a job? I'm a service designer. Oh, that sounds fancy. You know, that's kind of these dates we will have together. And then we will look at four dates where the goal is to make you look not stupid. So basically, when you're working with clients and they ask you questions like, when did it start? You have a date to give. And they feel like, hmm, he knows shit. That's good. Or uh, you work with an older service designer and you want to impress him. So you can say, ah, did you know that? And then he is also impressed. So that's basically uh, what I will give you in this 25 minutes that are remaining. And if you are not happy with that, that's not a problem. You have 25 minutes to enjoy Twitter and that hashtag before will come then a, a guy from a university. And he is an academic. He's a smart guy. And he will give you real information. So if you're not happy, do that. You will be happy in 25 minutes. And if you're OK with the rest, I will just start. So. Uh, what are six dates to look smart during their parties? Let's take our time machine and go back. Uh, one of the questions you could ask is, when did we start to have customers? OK. Uh, one date, 10,000 BC. That's the moment where you can say, we have the first customer and the first service. And why does that happen? Uh, some really serious people say that that's the moment where agriculture and separation of tasks happens. What does that mean for people like us? It means that you, know, you have that hunter guy who is like, mm, I want to get these, these bunnies. And you have the guy who is growing carrots. You know? And what happens is that the hunter guy says, oh, I'm too smart to do the carrot stuff, so I'm going to go to the carrot guy and says, carrot guy, um, could you get me some of, the, of your carrots? But the carrot guy is a smart one. So he says, hey, I will give you my carrots if you give me a big bunny. OK, we have a deal. Bam, you have the first contract in history. Really interesting. That's the moment where you have also the first customer. You have now a moment where people say, OK, you get me that, I will get you that. And basically the same thing that we do today with money. And what might we have learned from that? One very interesting thing might be expectation management. Now picture the hunter guy. Uh, he gets, he goes out and doesn't find a big bunny. But he finds a baby, a baby bunny, which is a bit big. And he thinks, ah, big baby bunny? That's, that's OK. It's big, even if it's a baby. So I'm going to kill it, bring it to the carrot guy, and say, hey, carrot guy, I found your bunny. And the, the carrot guy says, yeah, but that's a really small one. No, 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 no. It's a big one. It's a big baby. OK, you see what? That he, he tricked the guy with a, with a fake contract. So expectation management might have happened from there. So uh, from there, you might say, yeah, that's good, Daniele. We, we like that, but nothing to do with service. That's product, retail. OK, OK, I get you. So when did we create the first service? And there are very smart people in uh, Wikipedia. So I'm going to read that from a contributor in Wikipedia. He says, according to the trifunctional hypothesis of prehistoric Proto-Indo-European society, priests and priestesses have existed since the earliest of times and in the simplest societies, most likely as a result of agricultural surplus and consequent social stratification. Wow. OK, that was serious. Uh, what does that mean for us? Basically, with agri agriculture, crime, religion, that long phrase, Short phrase. Um, and what is interesting, as the son of, past, of a pastor, I know something that is religion isn't something you can touch. It's not a product. You know, it's kind of intangible thing. Uh, sometimes you see moments like the dancing of the guy we had before, but they are not like really tangible. And you know what is also intangible? A service. A service is intangible. And so is religion. OK, you see where I'm going here? OK, that basically what we can say is, well, that's my interpretation. Again, I'm no historian. Uh, that religion and priests might be the first service designers ever. Because you know, they designed something which was intangible, an experience which you couldn't touch. So 
they might be the first service designers. And you know what's funny? They, today, if you go to a church and you go on a Sunday, they call it a Sunday service. Okay, so there might be some clues there to say that religion might be one of the first. And what did we steal from religion as service designers? Obviously, the importance of storytelling. We heard about that, won't go much deeper in that, but every religion is really based on a big storytelling which creates sense around uh, big uh, events in life. Another thing is rituals. You know, when you got your um, beautiful croissant and they say, what, would you, uh, uh, what else can we give you? Okay, that's a ritual. You expect that they will sell you to, to that. And basically, in a religion, you have a lot of rituals too. Okay, 10,000 before Christ, first customer and first service. And from there, you can ask, when did we start to adapt things for human? Today, we have kind of this war where we have to explain to our clients, hey, people should, shouldn't adapt themselves to your product or your service, but you should adapt the, the service and the product to the people. That's basically what, what we're telling every day to our clients. And interestingly, that's something that happened around 500 BC with the first mentions of something people call today ergonomics. And the idea of ergonomics is basically to say that we want to improve the interaction between between humans and objects. Not so far away from what we do as service designers where we want to improve the interaction between people and services. So you could call ergonomics the cousin or one of the cousins uh, of service design. And one guy to know here is this wonderful dude here, uh, Hippocrates, you say that in English, I think? Um, and he had kind of a really good attitude. Uh, nice guy, doctor, he had this uh, do no harm rule. And he did another thing, he wrote a lot. And he wrote about this idea that you had to arrange medical tools in a certain way so that surgeons could do their work. So you know here what he's doing? He is adapting the space to the, church, to the surgeon and not say, you surgeon have to learn how to use the space and the tools. And what might have we st stolen from this guy? Basically, maybe observation. Uh, he was really, I will be, believe that he was looking how surgeons worked and then said, ah, I can learn from that. Or maybe he tested out things, suppositions. We don't know, but that could be coming from there. And so basically 500 BC, uh, the notion of adapting to the customer. When was co-creation created? We take our time machine back, we continue. 380 BC. Uh, another great guy, Plato, you might know him. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not personally, but basically he had this idea that he says, hey, what if we include people in creating a government? New idea, fancy idea. So if you don't like priests or religion or shamans, you can still say that it is this guy that, create, that was the first service designer, if you prefer that version of history. And let's be honest here, just a second, is everybody always brings back stuff to these guys to the big philosophers. Uh, engineers do that, architects do that, we do that, so it's, basic, it's normal that these are the fathers of everything. And one nice kick in the ass from here is basically that co-creation is the thing that was invented 2,000 years ago, and we still struggle with it today. So, yeah, kind of hard. So, 380 BC, co-creation. And now we do a big jump in history, and we could come with this question, when did distant customer support start? So we could say it's around 1876 with uh, guys like Graham Bell, Canadian, ni nice guy, or if you prefer Italians, that's the date that an Italian invented the telephone. Um, and why is the telephone so interesting to me? Because it's the first moment in history that you can complain from your bedroom and say, I hate you, man. That's not the product I wanted. It doesn't work. And that's really nicer because before you had to write a letter if you knew how to write, or you had to walk in the snow and go to the guy. And now you can complain comfortably. How nice. So technology sometimes really helps, even if I make fun of AI and machine learning in the, mini, in the beginning. So 1876, the invention of the telephone. And when do we start to focus on experience? In 1913, there is a guy who invents this notion of phenomenology. And it's highly philosophical stuff, so I don't know how it really works. 
let's be serious. But I found a guy who knows how this works, and he uh, wrote a nice piece about it. He's named uh, Joe Kissel, and he says, in a nutshell, phenomenology is an attempt to study experience itself objectively and scientifically. And there is this very depressed guy here, um, Edmund Husserl. He wrote a lot of stuff about that. He looks depressed because I can't draw well. Uh, I hope he wasn't depressed. And what Joe Kissel says about our dear Edmund, he says that he wanted to study the experience of the things as they present themselves to the observer without any assumption, predefinition, interpretation, or prejudice as to why or how they exist. Okay, deep stuff. Um, what did we steal from this guy? we might have still in this notion of customer experience. Uh, this guy said basically, oh, experience is something important. It's something you can study. And therefore, we should look at it. So the notion of customer experience might come maybe from there. And the notion of perspective, customer perspective, the idea that we say, okay, you might believe that your service is wonderful, but how do others feel about it? So 1913, phenomenology or the science of experience. When does the human-centered mindset come into the picture? 1939, with something called the client-centered approach. So my dad is a psychologist and we talk a lot together. And one thing we notice often is that we don't do the same job, but when we speak about what we do, we just notice you did exactly what I call co-creation, but you call it another way. Okay, that's interesting. And my dad comes from a um, psychology movement, which is called Rogerian therapy. And in this thing, they say basically that the psychologist is not the expert, which sounds pretty much like a service designer would say, I'm not the expert, the users are, so they tell me what I have to do. And there is a guy to know here, happy face Carl Rogers, and uh, he invented what is called client-centered approach uh, in psychotherapy, uh, or called also Rogerian um, psychology. And there are a lot of principles around that. I will just name two, which are really interesting. The first one is a non-directive approach. They say that the therapist isn't leading the conversation. The client is. Basically the same thing we do. We, do, we say, as a service designer, we don't lead. It's the client, the user, who tells us what we have to do. The other thing is the unconditional positive regard. I will change therapist by service designer. The service designer has a total acceptance of and support for his users. And this happens without casting judgment. OK, sounds familiar. No? OK, 1939, Rogerian psychotherapy or client-centered approach. So these were the six dates to look smart during your dinner parties. Uh, best tip that I can give you is remember one date. The other ones, forget them, and create a wonderful story around that. Because you don't need more than one story to impress people. And now, we'll go into serious stuff, where it's kind of four dates to not look stupid when you talk to nerds. And which nerds am I, am I talking about? You know, these service designers who are the academics, the, the guy who knows everything. And you have to work with him. And it's difficult, because he knows everything. And sometimes it would be nice, you know, just to give him a kick in the butt uh, by knowing something he doesn't know. So these are the dates you should kind of take and give him back. And these dates are kind of interesting to me because they help you also answer the critiques uh, that maybe your clients might have. So what could be these critiques or these questions? One question I get a lot from my clients is, hey, Daniele, what, when was this service design thing created? Is it serious at all? It feels to me that you created that yesterday. No, it was created in 1982. Uh, why do I pick this date? Because that's the date where the service design term is born. And there is a wonderful lady, Lynn Shostak, Shustak, uh, and I will call her the first mom of service design because there is a second mom we will talk about just after. And she really invented the term. She's a marketing girl working in banking, a wonderful philanthropist. Uh, yeah, it's our mom, basically. And another question might be, hey, Daniele, okay, it exists since 20 plus years, but that's no serious, huh? Okay, 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 I have something for you. 1988, we have SurfQual. Basically, it's a measure of service quality. And in other words, what the thing does is that it helps you to say shut up to people who have an Excel sheet brain. Uh, you know, the kind of people who say, if it doesn't work in an Excel sheet, it isn't true, you know? We all met these. 
And for these people, we have that. Wonderful formula, it looks really complicated. And basically what this formula says is that the service quality equals the individual perception of the service minus the individual expectation. So in human words, what does that mean? It means that the quality of a service depends on two things. First thing is, how do I feel when I experience the service? Okay, how good is this conference? Okay, Daniele, it's okay, you know? And then the other thing, you compare it to how I imagined it would be. So if you imagine this talk and you imagine, oh, that would be very academic stuff, you know, and I'm not academic cold, you would say the quality is really low. But if you had as a thinking, oh, that would be a fun thing because, you know, Swiss people are very fun, I don't know, uh, then you expect that, you see that, okay, and it's better than what you expected, so you have a good quality. Okay, nice formula, but what is really nice for the Excel guy is that there is a 22 question questionnaire that goes with it. And then they can like fill the questionnaire and it gives a bunch of numbers and diagrams and everybody is happy. So, you can come with the next critique. Okay, it's serious, it exists since 28. 20 years or something like that. It's even older than me, so that's okay. Uh, but is it a real movement? Is it not just you, Daniele, and your uh, few friends who are doing that, branding it service design to look smart? No, because in 2004, there is a thing called the Service Design Network, which is born. Basically what we are here. And then comes the second mom, uh, Birgit Mager. Um, I I didn't see her yet, so that's really good because I don't have to excuse myself to, to make her look much older than what she is. Um, and she is the second mom and the president of the Service Design Network. She's really doing all the kind of crazy work to make this kind of a uh, famous thing. There is a lot of people behind that Service Design Network thing too, but if you have to know one person, uh, know her. Uh, and plus she has that cool German name, Birgit, uh, which, you know, impresses in dinner parties too. So. We come then to this question. Is it recognized by non-nerds? Okay, you are few people doing that. There is a movement. It's quite old. It's quite serious because you can put it in Excel sheets. Uh, but is it just for nerds or normal people can enjoy that too? Yes, 2016, the first service design day. And you know, there is a donut day that you have every year. There is a cancer day you have every year. And now you have a service design day. So every 1st of June, now, you can celebrate service design. So if, if uh, we have a day, it's basically that we are serious. Donuts are serious, they have a day. Service design is serious, it has a day. And hopla, if it jumps. If this was too much information, and certainly it was, because it was 10 ideas uh, said extremely quickly by a Swiss guy with a French accent, an Italian look, you know, very disturbing things happening here. So if this was too much information given in a very difficult way, what should you remember? Just remember one thing, that we can build bridges between the past and today. We can learn a lot from what happened before. And we can see from there that we didn't invent shit, uh, that we just do what has been said 2,000 years ago and we try to not forget about it today. And if we are about building bridges, there is one bridge that you should know. And the longest one will be this one, 10,000 BC. That's when you have the first customer and the first service. Basically, I like this story because I'm the son of a pastor. I'm married to a pastor too. You know, so it makes my wife happy that I do service design when I, say, when I say that, because then I say, she invented service design. And that makes her really happy, and then I can do my, th I can do my things without her being, um, too pissed about it. So, if you have to remember one thing, remember this. I will say it like three or four times so it comes into the brain slowly. 10,000 BC, first customer and service. What, happens in, what happened in 10,000 BC? Religion can, comes and then there is something intangible, something intangible is a service, you have service design. 10,000 BC, okay, one more time, then it's in the brain. 10,000 BC, with the movement, you know, now you have it. Okay, so that was my little contribution, but you can contribute too, because this was just a tiny history 
of service design. And this is just my take. It's a very Euro Euro European guy uh, view, you know? Um, I'm not from here, I'm not from Canada, I'm not from Asia, so that's, obviously I will see, I will say the Greeks are the best, you know? So to say that our piece of the world has invented everything, so look at the history, look at the books, and to see, oh, maybe it's guys like the one who danced before who invented service design. Maybe you can learn from him something. So really make your own history, write it, go and look for it. Because one thing that I learned by doing this little journey of looking for myself is I learned a lot. And I'm not sure that anything is true in here, but at least I learned something. And I will really push you to do that on yourself. And if you're too lazy, or you're an academic, uh, that goes together sometimes, um, then what you can do is complain. And that's something which is really nice. You know, we saw in the history that through telephone, now you can complain at distance. With the internet, you can do the same. You can go on Google and look for a tiny service design history, Daniele Catalanotto. You will find a page. And you know, it's a medium article, which is two hour long read. And you go there and you write, Daniele, this is so wrong. And you give me the right information. And so other people who are uh, lazy will then be able to read stuff about this. So that's basically it. And I promised you in the beginning that you will receive the slides. So you have the link with the slides there. Um, there is also a very specific license, license under there, which is very important to me. Um, and the one thing here is go there, get the slides. You also have in that uh, a visual summary that you can have. So if you like drawings more than slides, you can read that. And yeah, that's basically it. So if you have to remember one thing, what is it? 10,000 BC, religion, service design, all come together. Thank you.